Okay, hello, hello everybody. I'll try and get through this as quickly as possible because there's a lot of very good talks on today and I'm sure we want to get ourselves between here and the other theatre and so on. Uh, also, we're just running a little bit behind, but I'll try and, uh, again, try and talk a little bit quicker, but not so much so that it all get, becomes a scrambled mess. So uh, this is a talk about modern game texturing and uh, that's what that is basically, is that this is a game that I'm working on. Um, it's basically set in Manchester, it's a bit like uh, Pac-Man versus uh, uh, Alien Isolation set in Manchester. By the way, apologies to anyone from Manchester, that's not necessarily an accurate depiction. <laughs> it, although, you know, some places. Uh, it, it is a relevant uh, reference material in any case. Uh, so what do I mean by modern game texturing? Uh, I mean kind of using Blender for a lot of the, uh, the props, basically, and the texturing, mostly the texturing, and doing that in as procedural a way as possible. Because basically you've got a, like a massive environment to do and you want to be able to generate as much of that stuff uh, quickly. So um, what do I mean by kind of the pipeline between this and a modern game engine is say in this case that was Unreal Engine 4 and so you want to be able to generate your textures which are going to plug into that basically. So you can see these are like the, what I've got going into there is just the four main uh, sort of textures that we're going to need. We're going to need the base color which is sometimes called albedo or some, in uh, the kind of blender equivalent is, would be called say the diffuse color if you kind of enable that render pass. Uh, you've got metallic, which we've not got a necessarily a kind of a, a direct connection with in Blender there. And then roughness and normal. And normal is just like a normal map. And a roughness is kind of like it as you would go into a roughness node in a uh, glossy shader. So uh, I've been doing some uh, tutorials for CG Masters over the last year, kind of touching on this topic really. So this is a very quick image, five minutes or so. Uh, just knocking up various basic geometry and uh, so some of you might have seen these tutorials but basically this is about a kind of a procedural way of doing some fancy looking uh, kind of uh, texturing on there and that by the way is just the if you look at the tutorial it's just basically manipulation of the magic texture we've also got things like trying to do cracks and so on cracks are very very important for uh, grungy atmospheres in games and so on so uh, you kind of need a way to be able to do uh, cracks and stuff and that's again followed there's already a tutorial online about that uh, on the CG Masters site you've also got an example of those things coming together so this is a kind of a basic stone texture and you can see the little, little cracks and so on that appearing on that texture are the ones from uh, the cracks node that you just saw. And that's kind of a, just an example of bringing it all together. So this is kind of a tiling texture on the ground there and uh, the object with the magic texture manipulation and like the stone texture and so on uh, being brought onto those props. So I've also done something for the Blender Cloud recently, just to give you a bit of background about me. Um, I kind of put together the recent game asset creation course on the Blender Cloud on, on Blender Steam as well. And uh, before that, I was doing some um, uh, basically environment work for TT Fusion, which is part of the Warner Brothers uh, Interactive Entertainment Group. Um, and they do the Lego games. And this is from the inside of the Statue of Liberty level on Lego Marvel. And we've also got another shot of that. And this is kind of what I mean by texturing. Uh, the key thing about, this is another tutorial on CG Masters by the way, uh, the, this is to do with you need in a game to be able to tile because you need to be able to have an optimized amount of textures to be able to run in the game otherwise the game becomes like you know terabytes and uh, really we just need like a very small section which is convincing enough to be able to tile both in X direction and Y direction and then it can cover a large surface and then, you know, we've got everything we need. The thing is, we also need various different maps. So this is an example of various different render passes that you can take from it, basically. Uh, and if you have a look on that, that's done on physics rather than particles as such, because you can see the kind of naturally and realistically have fallen into place. So they've got some of these coins around the sides and so on. And if you try to match one side to the other, you should be able to recognize that they do actually overlap and tile. Um, so basically what we'll be covering today, and I'm going to try and run through this as quickly as possible really, which should be plausible, uh, is the problem is when we're doing texturing in cycles, the procedural texturing, well you can see that this image here on the left is uh, basically just four planes 
uh, each with exactly the same texture on, so you might be able to see the, the tiling pattern slightly. But the problem with is you can see that there's obvious seams there. So we're going to look at basically correcting that and then having that then tile um, so that you can basically remove the seams and then you can use that in your render passes to take into Unreal or Unity or whatever. So uh, also we need to take a look at uh, cracks, another method of doing some cracks because you want to be able to control bevel amount and so on. So we'll take a little look at that. And that means we can then pass that in and manipulate it a little bit, get some sort of more realistic effects out of it. Uh, also, we've got kind of very, like what I was saying about being able to procedurally generate things, you've got these various different papers on the left and you've got these bags that are on the right. These are all very, very quick simulations and then you can render them out, get them as decals so that it's just an alpha channel around there and you can kind of see a lot of that working together. So we've got, again, that's essentially four planes. Um, in fact, let me just maintain on that for a second. So that is a tiling area. It's four planes with particles on. And if you put the camera in the middle of the cross section of those four planes with all those particles, you've got yourself a tile and texture. And that is an example of just grungy kind of, uh, because of the game that I'm working on, you know, it needs to be all lots of papers and so on. And that's basically an example of the same plane uh, that was rendered out, but taken into Unreal. So you can see kind of like newspapers and things like that all over the place. Also, we need kind of like a PBR shader, and it's not immediately obvious how, as I say, you convert those four textures that we were looking at trying to get, like the, 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 uh, the base color, the roughness, the normal, the uh, metallic. And this is kind of my uh, impression of a uh, version of that in Cycle, so you can test your materials before you quite get it into uh, uh, Unreal or whatever. So let's start with trying to get this um, uh, tileable uh, noise, basically. So this is simply, as I say, four planes in a quadrant there. And if you put the camera in the middle, you're basically going to get your tileable texture. But as you can see, we get these big seams. So um, I'm just wondering if you let me know if there's some stuff that look a bit clipped there, as you can see, because I'll try and um, I'll probably some stuff is going to be missing on this apparently actually so I'll try and uh, talk about this as much as I can so I'll try and fill in the blanks so uh, you have this tiling texture so uh, this noise texture I should say what we want to do is we want a gradient texture and that is what we've got there I've just got it plugged into the texture coordinates um, and oh no this is really cut off isn't it uh, so anyway, you've got this uh, UV coordinate out of the texture coordinates going into a mapping node, which isn't doing anything at the moment, but that's going into a gradient texture, and you can see how that looks. So we're going to basically use this gradient texture to blend between two noise textures, and that will hopefully remove our horizontal seam, and then we're going to basically do the same for the vertical. So let's just step through this. Uh, so what I've got on this now is... Uh, we have the second mapping node at the bottom is basically the key there. So we have a set to, uh, uh, the mapping node is set to one. So basically what the zero to one range is talking about is you've got zero on the left hand side of the model or on the plane in this case, just one of those quadrants. And then when you shift it to one, it takes it all the way, it just moves that tile, uh, the noise rather, and just moves that all, all the way over to one. So what's on this edge is now exactly what that other edge is, and so it should tile. And all you need to do is then plug those two noise textures into a mixed texture driven by the gradient texture, which is going to mix between the two. So um, we've got, as I say, that's a clearer indication of this than I hope. Uh, we're not on the right slide though, so let's go to... Um, my Polish is a little rusty. Uh, let's see. Uh, so yeah, this is where we were up to, I believe. Um, oh, I see what I'm doing wrong. Okay, how do you horizontally scroll these? I'll just do it like that. Okay, so you can see there, this is the mix node that I'm talking about, which is being driven by this gradient texture there. And uh, let's see, let's go to the next one. So. Oh, there we go. So then what we want to do is basically duplicate those same two te noise textures, move them all the way down, and have them still be informed as the same gradient as we were looking at before. And But you'll notice the mapping has been changed. So now instead of it going uh, blending 
sort of the, the noise from horizontally. I've, well, I'm still blending it horizontally, but I'm doing the, the, the position of that noise one unit above. So, uh, and then uh, beyond that, we're then going to take one last thing at the bottom, which is going to allow us to um, basically, uh, uh, so we're going to mix together those uh, again with that final gradient, which is being uh, the vertical gradient, which you can see here. And then, uh, as I say at the bottom, you can see the values of the mapping node is one and 90 degrees, just to sort of basically rotate it around so that we're getting it from black to white down to the bottom. And then that is what is informing a final mix node, which is just off the screen there. And it's just basically a simple mix node being, and the factor is driven by that uh, gradient. So as soon as you have that, all we want to do really is just basically put it into some sort of organization. So the noise value needs to be the same on every single noise texture. So that's why I've created this one input texture, this input value, um, and that's going to drive the scale of all these other ones. And then we have two more reroute nodes, uh, and we're just going to kind of plug them in, and that's going to make it easy for when we just create the group, and it just collapses it in, and then you can just sort of rename it to whatever you want, and then just click on the F to, fu to save it for future iterations. Once you've got that, you can then use that for informing the vector. If you've ever seen distorting our textures done in the vector, that's something that can be done on there as well. So. Now we're going to take a look at doing that tileable Voronoi cracks, and uh, what we're going to do is um, basically that's just a plane, and there's another object in the scene which is just a single vert, and that's it's very easy to, uh, to create. I mean, you can just take a regular plane and just collapse all the verts into one position. I just Alt M and then merge at center, and then this is basically got a particle system. We have. Uh, over here, we've actually got a um, hundred number. The, the emission number is a hundred, and then basically you want them all to appear at the same time, which is this is saying one. Uh, so it's starting on and ending on frame one. A little bit further down, we've got the physics. Uh, so we don't really need any physics. I just need them to appear on the plane there. So I'll turn that off, and then a little bit further down towards the emitter settings, it's set to object down here, and the object that it's being used is that single vert object. And now at this point, we basically want to, uh, what you get from that, you want to then apply that particle system. So you go over to the modifiers tab, you hit on the apply, that's going to create a whole load of however many you've set of those points, those single verts, and it's going to create a load of uh, objects. You want to join them all together, so you're just working with one bit, and then whilst in uh, edit mode of that, you can uh, select them all, copy them, move them over exactly two units on the X and then copy the, what's on that top row there and go and duplicate that again and then move that down two units. And so you have something which is basically, if you put the camera in the middle of that, it's going to tile. So uh, also note that that large face there in the background is just needed to give the cell fracture something to work with, but you need that to expand beyond the verts. Um, this is the cell fracture uh, settings. And thank goodness I've decided to put some on the left for a change. You've got, it's basically, these are the settings you're going to need. You're going to need it to do it, for, instead of using, say, own particles or the, the child verts or whatever, you want these own verts. And this is why we're not using particles in this case, because we needed to have the verts all in that quad, those four quadrants, because the particles otherwise would be just completely randomly arranged on the plane. So with that, you want the source limit to be beyond, be beyond the amount of uh, verts that you're using. So I was using about 100 or so uh, in the emission number. So it's four times 100 plus the four that were of the uh, making up that kind of boundary plane. Uh, we definitely don't want any noise because that's just going to ruin the placement of what we've done. Uh, the reason that we're trying to get things to tile. Recursion, same reason. We want to turn that off. We can always do some recursion afterwards. Uh, and then also we want to turn off the apply split edge. So those are otherwise the default settings that you have. Uh, and it's going to stick everything on the next layer, which is fine. So that's the result. And you might be able to notice that that actually does tile. You can sort of see like a dense area here, 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 and here. And then you, what you can do is select an in uh, kind of a central part of it, right in the middle there. And just make sure that that does tile. So you can see kind of maybe this piece here is uh, if you were to copy them all over, you can kind of see that's equivalent here. Uh, on, so 
that piece there is the same as that piece. And you can kind of just keep on selecting so you kind of realize, hey, yeah, I've got everything in the middle there. And then we can copy them to another layer or just clean it all up and just delete everything else and then set up the camera. The, the key thing with this camera here is that it's got to be set to orthographic. So I have a nice little properties window on the screen here which says you've got the options at the top, perspective, orthographic and panoramic. You want the orthographic option and the orthographic scale to be set to the amount of blender units you want to encompass within the uh, camera that you're looking through which we can see in this 3D view and that's set to two as I say. And uh, so you can see one, uh, so from zero, one, and two uh, units wide. And then uh, that just makes it easy for my uh, numerical, not non-numerical brain, I guess. So you've got like, just a simple two units to work with. And then once we've got that, we can kind of place it up in the corner. So just, just up one unit, aside one unit. And then you want to basically create the others as in, I mean, I've done this as instances. So these are, this is an alt D duplication, uh, G, X, two, over to the uh, right hand side and then those two alt D again and then Y uh, negative two just to move it down to here and then they uh, are perfectly into position so the right the camera's looking right on and then these cracks here now are going to be tiling. The thing is you, you uh, I've actually switched to the map cap view for the normal map there and then turned off ambient occlusion just make sure ambient occlusion is off because that kind of wrecks the view. I mean I, I've looked at a lot of normal maps and you kind of come to kind of uh, it freaks you out if you see lighting information on one so just kind of keep that off and then uh, I have a bevel modifier here which is just essentially what I'm doing is trying to get as wide a bevel as possible with the bevel modifier um, which is slightly off screen but so it's just a bevel modifier the width is 0 0.01 and the key thing here is to turn off the clamp overlap because the some of the geometry you get from the cell fracture is a little bit messy and it doesn't maybe work perfectly, uh, but it, I've noticed that it actually does work most of the time uh, for this kind of method. So just bang through it with 0.01, clamp overlap turned off and then basically set it to angle and then say maybe just the default of 30 is fine. And so you get this kind of result, but we wanna basically copy that to the rest of them. So just uh, control L to just link the modifiers with the main one that we've done as the active object. So that'll just copy whatever settings you do to that. And then uh, it just copies it through the other ones and we're getting this nice bevel. So next we're gonna talk about the texture passes and especially the Z depth and the normal uh, pass. So this is the uh, the scenes tab now in the node editor and we're using the nodes as you can see there and this is a whole bunch of um, passes that I tend to enable to be able to get the kind of textures that I need. Uh, the key ones here you know you've got things like Z and normal, ambient occlusion, mist as well for another type of Z pass basically, a height pass in other words and then you've got the emit and the diffuse color so sometimes I'll be using the emit, sometimes I'll be using the diffuse instead so I just kind of tend to enable all, all of those and that gives me everything that I need. So um, I'm assuming that you know how to do that because it's cut off but if, it, if not it's in the properties window, the scenes tab, um, uh, the layers tabs excuse me the second one along and then you get the Z uh, mist normal passes that you can enable there and the diffuse color ambient occlusion emission in there. So if we take a look here you can see a, I'm coming out of the alpha channel and if you want the alpha channel to basically show up you're going to need to do one more thing which is to go to the render tab which is the first one in that properties window the little camera icon come down to the bottom there under the film section and you'll notice that there's a little film uh, a transparent checkbox you want to enable that and then you'll be able to get a decent alpha channel out of it so this is the normal map and that's uh, comically cut off of what it says huh meaning that's not really what we were expecting in terms of tangent space uh, normal map. So we're going to need to cor correct that. And the way that we would do this, we can basically debug it by just essentially putting a sphere into it and then re-rendering. And then what we can do is start breaking that down by taking the normal pass into a separate RGB node. And then you can see here, uh, that's basically what the R channel is doing. This is what the green channel is doing, so it's going up and down. And this is what the blue channel is doing, so it's going straight down. Now, luckily, that is a normal map. That is what a normal map should represent. The red channel's side to side, green channel's up and down, and the blue channel is uh, the depth information. So we need to basically correct what's going on here because obviously it's only start, we need it to start from the left-hand side of the, s the sphere 
uh, uh, black and then be white on the other side of the sphere and have it uh, be a linear gradient across. So basically this is the image editor and I'm just uh, enabled the viewer node in, as to what to look at here. And on the left hand side you can, s can you see? Yeah, down here it's a value of minus 12.6698. So that isn't really what we're looking for. We're looking for black there, and uh, but in the middle it is actually uh, zero, and on the right hand side it is actually one. And if we basically just add a math node set to add and just add a value of one to that, this is the result that we get instead. So this little red dot here represents the sample value that I've got, and this is now basically black. So that's essentially that's what we want. The problem is, as you can see, the middle is now one, and we don't want that to be the middle, we want it to be the far right inside. So if you basically just stretch that out by half, like multiply that by half, you're getting, gonna get it to be twice as long. So, uh, and now you can see that on the right hand side there, it's basically one. It's just my uh, inaccurate mouse pointing to, that it didn't get to exactly one. So the good news is we can just do that with all channels. So instead of using math nodes now, I'm just using the color mix nodes. So the color mix nodes set to add, and we're just adding white to all three channels in one go there. And the multiply node is just uh, set to uh, 0 0.5. So you're gonna multiply 0 0.5 and you basically get this. I realize that isn't quite right just at the moment. Uh, the other note to m mention about that is that this is RGB 0.5 rather than it being HSV. If you do HSV 0.5, that won't work. It's got to be RGB. And then the only other thing that we need to do is just correct, correct for the gamma. So once you put 2.2 .2 in there for the gamma, you basically get your render result here now is much more equivalent or basically the same as uh, what you would expect a normal map to be. So now you can set the resolution and we can always get the normal map that we need looking from the camera going straight down. The, uh, all I've done there now is just add a, um, a frame with shift P over the, uh, the, the nodes that are basically creating our normal map for us. And then this, what we're seeing here in the viewer node is just the ambient occlusion. Now that's really simple. That's just a really straightforward pass to render. Just enable it and we've got it. Uh, the Z, not as straightforward. It just looks like a pure white image, but clearly it's not. It's just, um, uh, there's far more detail there that can be represented on screen just in its native format. So what we're gonna do, need there is just a map value node and then uh, also note that this camera is four units high and uh, what we're gonna do then is just essentially correct for that in the map value node. So you can see the offset there is just slightly more than negative 4.04 just to bring it up, up, up up a bit and then essentially we're just scaling it right down so minus 25 to just kind of get it into something which is more uh, relevant for us. The problem with this though is it's kind of a bit aliased and you tend to get that for very cavernous changes in height, uh, precipitous changes in height I should say. Um, so uh, but the mist node seems to be a little bit more forgiving. I to be honest, I probably could have just created a plane at the back of that alpha channel, and you know the Z depth would probably work fine, I think. Uh, but anyway, the way that I tend to correct for this anyway is just use the mist pass, and then that gives us sort of an inverted height, uh, so we can just add a color ramp, just hit the double arrows there to flip it, and now we're basically getting it. Uh, the thing is, uh, that's not quite the right value, so it's quite close by default, but I want to basically shift that. So in the camera properties, in the properties window, which again is cut off, uh, you can set to display the mist. And that's what this little thing is down here. And if you set the uh, mist settings, uh, I think in this case, they're set to 3.99 and 0 0.08. So is it 3.99 is just slightly before four units away from the camera. And then this is now 0 0.08 units long. Uh, we don't quite want that because the, the, the result isn't brilliant, but I mean, this is just demonstrating that that's what the settings were. Uh, if we actually change it instead to just start exactly on top, so four, and then just make, shrink it even further, so 0 0.04, and set the fall off to the mist to be linear, which is the settings directly underneath, then that basically works for you. Uh, so then we've got a decent uh, height map that we can take out of it. Should you want to do some decent um, texture blending based on height, we can take that as the mix factor. Uh, all I've done here now is essentially organize things a little bit more. So I've just 
hit shift P around the reroute, no reroute node to do ambient occlusion. And then the normal is up here now, the Z depth is just there. So I'm just using these three. Also I've set viewer nodes, depending on which one you click on, gives you your render pass that you're viewing in the viewer node. And then uh, one last thing is just doing an alpha over uh, f because basically I only rendered the parts of the uh, cracks, the mesh parts. Uh, we want to actually alpha over something. So I've just alpha overed uh, a flat blue co normal color, which is 0 0.5 red, 0 0.5 green, and one blue. And then if you pop, put that before the gamma node, everything should work out on the normal map. Um, the only other thing we need to know about is basically saving out those maps. What would we need to do? So we can go over to the image, save as image, and then just remember to um, whether you're doing alpha settings there, we want RGBA if it's alpha, and then usually for height stuff, you want to use 16 bit at least. Um, so it, again, this is tiling. So that's just the texture this time. This is the image texture for the height. And instead of using four separate planes, I've actually just set the scaling to two. Um, just to, to shortcut that basically. And now I've just created a little sun lamp there and uh, set it to a strength of three, just a simple plane, uh, just to show it going into the bump node of a diffuse map, uh, diffuse shader rather. And you can see essentially we're getting the nice bumpy details in there that we just created and there's no artifacts or banding or anything. Uh, the normal map, again, just set that to normal, non-color data to be able to get that to create, to show correctly in the viewport. Get, that's going into a normal map vector node instead of a bump node this time, and we're just going through to another diffuse shader. Problem is, you notice that it actually looks a lot more softer than this one, so I tend to go through and then just set the bump value to half strength and it kind of looks a lot more equivalent to hey, how your normal map bakes are going to be. So you can bear that in mind when you've got elaborate nodal systems in your textures, and then you kind of render them out thinking the normal map's going to be exactly the same. Maybe you want to represent that in the viewport with uh, half strength, as I say. Uh, so something else that we can do with this uh, is actually alter the bevel distance on the fly now by just using a color ramp. So you can see the bevel distance is actually a lot smaller by just tucking in the color ramp, and then you can reverse it by just bringing it the other way and now you get a, a larger separation of cracks and this is kind of in, I mean important because if we take our tileable noise now we can plug that in so this is just an updated version of that tileable noise just really simple like color and boronoi just coming out of it and then if you take the mapping text the the coordinates plug that into the tileable node uh, the noise as a vector and then come out of this into a, just a color mix node you're basically gonna get, gonna add a teeny tiny bit of distortion to the vector, and that's what has, ends up informing the position of all the information on the texture map in the viewport, uh, which is great for much more natural looking stuff. So you could combine that with larger scale noise and combine that with a smaller, uh, um, kind of like in general art, you would have large shapes, medium shapes, and then maybe some sort of uh, high frequency detail in there in certain places. Uh, so what I've done here is just, um, created some extra nodes and duplicated and moved them down. Uh, so another tileable noise, another color ramp, well, a, a color ramp in this case, and then that's gonna get plugged into the add of the image itself, just to mask out some places of the uh, cracks. The noise itself actually looks like that. So we're just gonna add the white to the bump map, which creates this as the bump map that is now being plugged in and then basically you're going to get a variation in height across the surface and then you can render that out and that's kind of like if you're doing tarmacs and stuff like that which I was doing cracks like that are very important and but you don't want them to be really angular and flat all the time sort of just connecting as they do sort of very procedurally you want them to have slight wave to it and things like that and then you can so you can achieve that with the tileable noise that we've already covered so also what I wanted to take a look at is just some of the very procedural, very, co I mean, I realize I'm explaining this, so it seems maybe like it takes longer than it really does. It's, it, you can bang through it extremely fast, um, but you can kind of get in a plane in this case, set it to be collision, which we can't quite see there. So in the physics tab in the properties window, you have collision, uh, you can just enable that. And then uh, that's really all you need to do. What we need to do then really is create the what we're going to squash or create. So this, let's say this is a piece of paper now. So I've created another plane, uh, unwrapped it, simple unwrap. I've subdivided it, obviously. Um, and uh, now what we want to do is 
create a solidify modifier. The reason the solidify modifier is on there is because when the paper falls and it crumples and it kind of folds on, you kind of get the other side of the paper, and this kind of gives you a kind of a bit more uh, realistic feedback in the viewport when you run it. And also, then I've got a subsurf modifier just to add as much uh, geometry as possible for which to uh, create a decent simulation. So what we're going to do then is in the physics tab, you want to uh, enable the soft body. Uh, which is slightly off, and then I've just, in the viewport there, I've just enabled uh, ambient occlusion just to see a little bit how it's kind of interplaying with it, within itself. So um, soft body settings here that I've used really, just completely default. Uh, if you do that though, you'll notice that it just hangs in the air, and what you don't, so you don't want that. What you want to do is just turn off the soft body goal, that's what's basically causing it to just hang in the air. As soon as you turn that off, it just collapses down onto the collision and everything is great, but it just looks a little bit flat and squashed because it's not um, basically taking consideration of itself and that's what we need. So as soon as you enable the soft body collision, the self collision, uh, you get a much nicer result. So the only thing that we need to do then is essentially I made, make a duplicate in case you want to uh, come back to tweak the settings. Uh, which is a lot of fun to do with just physics uh, stuff. And then we're just going to duplicate it. Then what we do is uh, in the physics we can, uh, in the modifier tab, we want to apply that soft cloth. So we just got a model then. And then um, essentially uh, move it out of the way so that we can actually just work on this. And then the way I tend to work on this now, I want a much more crumpled rather than soft looking thing. So after the first subsurf, we decimate it. We uh, triangulate the decimation and then take the ratio right down, so this is 0 0.07, and it removes almost all of the uh, edges. So you get kind of edges which go along kind of uh, diagonal lines and stuff, and you get kind of a much more crumpled view. Uh, also, you can go tab into the uh, geometry itself, just get all the border edges there, hit Shift E, and then uh, crease them all to one, so that the subsurf modifier is basically um, going to kind of create nice sharp edges all around the uh, the paper in this case. And then I tend to do another subsurf after that, which is going to be set to two in this case, which you can't quite see. And then uh, it's set to a simple algorithm rather than a Catmull Clark, which will kind of uh, end up undoing some of that work that we've done. So we get a bit more angular, a bit more crumpled looking thing to it. The last thing to do is just set the origin to geometry with shift control alt C and then apply the rotation and scale and then in this case uh, in the viewport we're just looking at the only only the render stuff I've enabled the mat cap there with basically no specular on it just to get a good idea of how it's probably going to look and then also I've squished it down on the Z axis so S Z and then just squish that down a little bit more so it's like much more flattened uh, this is just a basic grunge texture, which is also procedurally generated in Blender, but I'll have to cover that another time. Uh, it's just essentially the contrast is being reduced by just raising the black level to be in mid-gray, and then that's just going into a diffuse shader, and we can kind of see what's happening there. Um, also, by the way, I've created this extra UV map dot print, uh, so that we can just take that extra UV map and then essentially place that over a uh, kind of a, an image texture that you might have got, some, the, some stuff that I got from online in that case, and then just essentially have the image texture be informed by the UV map node, where you can inform it, that image to be placed by that particular UV map, so in this case UV map dot print, and then that is just being uh, added together with the other grunge, so we could basically get um, uh, something that looks a bit like this in the bottom left there. So with this, uh, you want to be able to do some more crumpling, so just randomly select some more edges and go shift E to do the creasing on that one and that, that kind of gives you a bit more like this and then just go through create some more this took me about 10 minutes uh, just most of that just playing around really so you got the larger versions which look much more like cloth and sort of rags and things like that which might be quite good for in a grungy scene but if you flatten them right down you kind of get a much more um, kind of uh, you know paper cardboard squashed stuff like that uh, which is um, going to be pretty good for that kind of thing so um, this is them for the particle system these are the planes on the left the bags on the right as uh, two separate um, uh, particle systems, and that's what goes into here to create that um, thing. So we've got the same again, uh, which is the, uh, this is a wireframe version. So you can see again, it's just four planes in those four quadrants, same particle system with each. Um, make sure the seeds are all exactly the same and that they're using the same modifiers on everything. And then it should tile. If you put the camera in the middle of that, it tiles. Uh, this is two particle systems. 
So particle system one is the, uh, the, the, the bags, I guess, and then the other one is the paper, and then you can get different settings for each uh, if you want to be able to do them at different points. So, uh, and again, instead of just using the single vert object that we used before to create the tileable Voronoi cracks, it's basically the same kind of thing. I realize, it, again, it's cut off slightly, but down here under the emitter, uh, you want to set that to group, and then the duplicate group would be papers, or the other uh, particle system would be bags. And then this is how the textures look, kind of, uh, with giving them all sort of basically just very, very simple stuff. And then that's how it looks, um, just taking a look at a basic diffuse of, um, uh, sorry, an emission of how that texture looks. Then, if we move over to our setup that we had, you have kind of the Z depth, the albedo with ambient occlusion and depth, which is, again, just to reiterate, that's kind of basically the base color, which is taking the emit to pass this time I've decided to use. And then um, I'm multiplying that against the ambient occlusion straight out, but I've also got a little ambient occlusion part there, which is easy enough. So my albedo was uh, multiplied with the uh, uh, ambient occlusion, and then I've just overlaid uh, just a tiny little bit of that Z depth as well, just to offer a little bit more um, uh, depth to the uh, albedo, really, because you don't want the game engine to kind of do too much. It just seemed like that was what was required in this case. Also, you'll note at the bottom here, the normal, this little green thing, Unreal Engine, the green channel is flipped. So I've, I just created this little switch, which essentially does exactly that in this little node here. All it is is a separate RGB node, uh, flip the, um, but I, do, I think it's just a one minus on the green channel, and then uh, re gather that together and then put it back into here as a, as a flip, very simple stuff. But to be honest, there's a checkbox for that in Unreal anyway, which is what I would always tend to do because I'm so used to looking at normal maps without the green channel flipped, it really messes with my head to actually visualize that. So I tend to not do that. So uh, here we have the, that's what the ambient occlusion looks like on its own. This is then, then a, uh, a mitt uh, pass just going into the viewer, so that's what the emit on its own looks like. So that's kind of like a really much more accurate albedo, I guess. Um, but really, I wanted to amplify that with the ambient occlusion and the uh, give it some more depth. With and so you can see it's not massively different. If I scan between the two, if you can just about see that. Um, you can kind of just about see that. Crikey. Anyway, so then we've got our normal map, uh, which basically looks a bit like that, a little long vertically sliver thing. And then this is it in game. So this, though, that's what, how, you know, taking those textures together, that's what they look like in game. The metallic, this isn't metallic, so the metallic's set to zero, and the roughness is just using the uh, red channel from the diffuse. So you don't always have to generate those uh, textures necessarily. And this is an example of it in the game. So you can kind of see up here, uh, this is the uh, grunge sort of papers and cardboardy type stuff that we've done doing. I've just multiplied it with just a noisy looking cloudy uh, alpha channel and then painted that in in places in Unreal, but that's, a, that's a, for another topic. Also, you'll notice all these cracks on the tarmac, by the way, all created in exactly as we've been through just before. So this brings us to PBR. So the stuff in there was... Uh, uh, the way Unreal Engine is doing it, that's on PBR, and I'm going to go through this really quick. Uh, this is essentially the uh, result of that, and again, people can probably correct me, but this is very, very equivalent to how it seems to appear in Unreal anyway, at least in my test, so it seems good enough in my case. Uh, this is looking a little bit more complicated than it really is. It's just this uh, node group. Um, these have just got helpful hints and tips as to what to do about don't use extreme, don't use zero and one because they're not realistic values and it usually looks weird and breaks things. So uh, basically, um, this is the world map. So again, I've set this to transparent, so which is why you're getting that checker pattern in the background. And uh, this is the world um, uh, nodes for the material and it's just a simple mapping node set to an environment texture not an image texture but an environment texture which is just uh, downloaded from um, these uh, HDRI labs or something like that and then plugged into the background that's set to three but I think I do actually most of the tests on one coming up so unplugged all the textures so we've basically just got nothing going into the normal really black, near black roughness, and near white albedo, and zero metalness. This is kind of like the effect that we get. I think you'll be able to 
just about work this out. But the, the, there's other things online. Actually, there's a really good uh, YouTube channel by Cinecat Pro, I think it is. Uh, he explores a lot of PBR stuff. This isn't really going in as detail as this. Um, this is basically, he's going on about the Fresnel aspect of it, which probably should be incorporated, but in a typical setting for this anyway, I'm really just talking about the PBR in terms of the, uh, the preservation of light. Uh, so in other words, uh, when we set something in, so this is very, very low, um, 0 0.05 on the value here, I'm just using a, a, a uh, just setting that to, on the HSV to 0 0.05 and basically we've got a white highlight down here coming from the reflection map we want that basically to spread out and kind of get a bit dimmer that's kind of what I mean by PVR so that's what we want to do we want to take that and then up it to 0 0.1 0 0.2 0 0.3 and all the way up and you can see what I mean by it kind of spreading out a little bit and that's kind of the effect that we're looking for so and again, just testing the other thing, you've got the albedo, which is a bit orange, and then uh, it's very, very, it's quite smooth. It's kind of like half roughness, really. And then uh, you've got the metalness is set to zero. But if you set the metalness to one, you kind of get these kinds of colors. So you kind of get the, the, the reflectivity is informed by the albedo color, which is kind of how it works in Unreal Engine anyway. So how to set this up? So the typical setting, diffuse shader, glossy shader needed to be mixed into a mix shader. That's really, really straightforward stuff. Um, now what we want is a value which is going to control the roughness. And uh, if you think about the roughness for the glossy, so how rough something is for the glossy roughness is gonna basically take it from being a mirror shine at zero to being a much more broad uh, kind of, uh, you know, rough <laughs> uh, surface, and uh, therefore that all the highlights are going to be spread out. Um, the thing is, we need to switch these up around in the mix shader because the factor, the more rough something gets, the more it wants to show its diffuse color, if you see what I mean. So the, the, the value that is in here, so when we've got a value of one, we're basically saying it's completely rough, so therefore please show me the diffuse color, basically. And that's the PBR in a nutshell. So <clears throat> Once we've got that, um, we want to then be able to, uh, let's see, um, create a RGB color thing. That's just standing in for a texture right now. So that's kind of nearly bright white. And that wants to inform both the diffuse color and the glossy color. And this is the crucial bit for getting something which is kind of like helpful for converting stuff into Unreal. And uh, so, but we don't want it to color the reflection. So I'm just using a color ramp node there just before it goes into the glossy to essentially just remap everything to black to white. So whatever happens to be in there. And then uh, I've created a normal um, uh, sort of reroute node, which is just plugging into the normal. So um, depending on whether you're using a normal map vector mode, uh, node or a bump node, that would then plug into this. Uh, so that's just going into the normal sockets of both. And uh, then I've just duplicated the color ramp, the glossy and the mix shader down. Uh, and just, they're all muted at the moment. And this is gonna prepare for the metalness. So what I've done there now is uh, basically, we're now taking a look at the mix shader again. And, but we've just deleted the, co the color ramp because we don't want to have um, a, a black and white. We don't want to have black and white specular for metals. That's the main difference between metals and non-metals. So uh, then we want to just add a mix shader between the results of these. So this is metal down here and this is non-metals up here. So we need to have a um, uh, little value to control the metalness. And that is basically it. Then all we need to do is add a few rewrote nodes so that when we come to select everything, B, and then uh, press Control G to put it into a group, it doesn't create tons and tons of inputs for you. So the problem with that is clearly that it's just called input, input, and that's input, and then that's input. So you need to be a little bit more helpful than that. So if you tab into the group, you'll see that we've got uh, some opportunity to rename stuff there. And the normal is gray at the moment, as, as in the color isn't representative of what it actually is. So I tend to, I haven't done that here, but I tend to just force it. So I might delete that one and then take a normal map and then just plug it into this group, the spare socket, and then to kind of rejig things around. So it just forces it into the right kind of thing. Then after that, just rename it, click the F so you'll save it. And then that's it for that. That's then coming back to the first slide where we basically just see uh, the PBR stuff. 
And that is, again, um, an impression of how it then looks in uh, Unreal. So you can see that kind of stone texture, which again, just simple things that we've covered. They're just particles of small, very simple rocks. Um, uh, just sort of scattered across the surface and then um, so this is blending via height as well so I've taken out the height map that we covered uh, this has got cracks as I say in the diffuse that we've done and then it's basically just vertex blending between the two um, textures that I've got this tarmac and this um, uh, stone rubbly type one and then also another thing to just create these puddles on top um, then I just almost finished now this is just the last minute or so uh, just taking that same thing you can just create a bunch of very very basic objects litter props basically and then just squash them down all that is is pretty much standard cloth simulations uh, just break them down just run the simulation and then just as it starts to fold in on itself just stop it there and apply that and then move on to another one maybe angle it slightly different do the same thing and uh, you can do that with loads of different things I was ended up with this so I just created a, uh, a camera just pointing straight down at all this stuff and this is bl in Blender internal so that gives me an opportunity to just mention briefly that we've got PBR coming to Blender internal anyway or at least you know another option which you can select and that's going to be amazing when we do get that but we can get pretty far with uh, the internal stuff anyway but as you can see there that's just the bakes so that, that, that isn't geometry anymore that's just a plane uh, it's just a flat planes uh, and then you, these are the ones that I decided to use in game for now. I'll probably add the, the, the rest of them at some other point. And so I just cut them up so there's not much space overdraw in the engine. So you don't want too many areas of just blank alpha stacked on top of each other. That's bad. Um, and that's a, a sort of looking down on it in the game. So you have these various different planes. So that's just a plane. Uh, these all these little litter things that are kind of interacting with the scene and stuff it's just a litter plane uh, just a scattered amount of particles you can see again there's the, uh, the the two textures that we're blending and a little bit later on uh, further up we've got things like the uh, the water puddles and stuff like that it was you know it's kind of trivial really so these bags as well they're just by the way just cloth simulations done in about two minutes um, so uh, and then that actually brings us back to the start I think that's concluding and Thank you very much for bearing with half the screen. I'm not sure whether I'm supposed to be taking questions or whether it's time Three minutes. or... Sorry? Three minutes left. Three minutes left. If anyone wants to... I'm obviously here for the whole conference, uh, but if you've got any questions, you can throw them at me now or later or whatever. So question. Why do you sometimes prefer the uh, mid pass on it's usually just because I've got the node wrangler add-on enabled and so that means you can quickly go control shift on any of the nodes and that automatically hooks it up to an emission shader so if because of that sometimes I have them both done so if I forget I'm doing that I can kind of quickly go through and if but if I'm doing a diffuse shader because I wanted to, to look at how it was uh, looking in terms of like oh look I've done the proper PBR setup I actually want to look at that uh, and then I, if I rendered then that would be all set up for doing the um, uh, diffuse color I would need to do that so it's just depending on what I might be debugging at the time or, I mean I should say the roughness by the way is just just hook up the roughness to an emission shader hit render again and then you've got your roughness setting and then you've got your roughness map uh, just plug that into the engine done no problem anything else cool thank you again thank you